I just kind of like have run out of clothes again, as sometimes happens when I've failed to do laundry for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Um, when Josh wears one pair of clothes, he just chucks it out the window once he's done. A pair of clothes. A A pair? He always wears two clothes. Mm -hmm. So today I just (laughs) threw on this like Adidas track jacket that I have. Yep. And I'm also wearing sweatpants and I feel like I'm about to go down to Sheep's Head Bay. Like I'm going to go down to like the Avu station and meet a guy known as Anatoly about a job, you know? I feel very much like you should be in a photo squatting and doing Mm -hmm. Mm two peace signs. I remember once doing like extra work on some TV show that I never heard of after filming it. Uh And it was out at the end of one of the train lines that goes out to Queens where it was just like the last stop. And the thing that I noticed so much was just the further out I got, the more everyone was just wearing track suits and <laughs> Adidas flip flops. It was just like mountains of clothes outside of windows. And yeah, just yeah, constantly right. throw them out. them out. Of course. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a local. Um, I, the other big piece of it, too, is I feel like I remember as well when I was in London. Like Mm -hmm. track suits have a very different connotation in London Mm -hmm. and a lot of it is just straight up like anti-ethnic bigotry. I remember like I was almost turned down at not a particularly nice establishment. Like I'm so floored at how in the UK they have bouncers at at, they've got the they've got fucking bouncers at the McDonald's. I almost got bounced from the fucking, you know, uh, (laughs) elephant and castle McDonald's for wearing a track jacket like and then just you just ridiculous. had to be like no it's okay i'm dutch american what was so what's so <laughs> funny is that is actually exactly what happened is i started talking <laughs> and they're like oh okay just don't do it again so many possible worlds but we got this one so many possible worlds but we got this one Welcome to the worst of all possible worlds, the first and only tracksuit enthusiast podcast. Yeah, I baby. am the worst of all possible Brian's. I'm Mickey Mouse. What? <laughs> <laughs> I no. hate you both so much. He's the worst of all possible AJ's. I'm the worst of all possible Josh's. And this week we are joined by Dara Swisher of Sovereign Candle Collective. Uh, A longtime theater artist, someone who has worked in dance and uh, burlesque and immersive theater, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Spoilers, this is going to be an extremely Brian episode. And and Dara, you've got some stuff going on. Uh, Tell us about what you're doing. I do have some stuff going on. Um, So I have over my years of my life um, been mostly a performer, like a dancer first and then an actor. And then I got into stage management, like I kind of tripped and fell into it. And then I got into production management and project management and all that stuff. Uh, And now I'm trying to produce for off Broadway which is really cool and really hard. I am producing this new musical in a season of a lot of revivals. I'm just going to say there's not a lot of new works. It's called Here I Am, not to be confused with Sondheim's piece. I know. It's okay, that show's done now. Yeah, it closed closed today. You're in the clear. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Get out of here. Get out of here, Bobby Cannavale, in your tracksuit. (laughs) (laughs) He's not in it. So you're going to see something new. But are you going to see tracksuits? Listen, I don't want to give everything away. (laughs) Oh, sure, sure, I can't tell you all the secrets, but it is a new musical for the modern era, and it deals with social media in a kind of cool way. It's a very Zoomer musical, and I say that very, I I say that with with effusive praise. I think it's a very interesting piece that has a lot of young talent attached to it. So go to hereiamthemusical.com and check us out because tickets are on sale and we're opening at AMT Theater for previews on March 1st. So it's coming up really fast. Yeah. This week, we are talking about the immersive theater extravaganza Sleep No More, which mm. you might have heard of. Uh, it's been running in New York for a really, really long time. Yep. And it is going to be closing, apparently. Allegedly. Uh, Allegedly. <laughs> it was supposed to be closing at the end of January. They've extended to the end of February, but mm-hmm. presumably uh, they have it extended will... it to the end of March. They now. have? Yes. <laughs> oh, we're closing. It'd be awful if you bought tickets. Don't. Don't, oh, don't no. do it. Oh, oh, no. No. If you bought oh, tickets, no. Ooh, Please, don't no. put 400 people inside of me every <laughs> night. But these tables are reserved. Don't sit here. Yes, right. Sit right. Here. So, you know, uh, we thought it would be closing at the end of January. We'll see if it actually closed or not but sleep no more is one of those things that is 
very foundational to a lot of immersive theater, which means that it's Brian's special interest. And then also, I think, you know, we've talked a fair bit about Shakespeare on the show, specifically mm-hmm. Hamlet. This one has more to do with the so-called Scottish play Macbeth. And we'll be talking a bit about that as Josh, well. Josh, you can't say that. In a Zencaster. So anyway, Macbeth uh, <laughs> is a play that we haven't covered, oddly enough, on this show. There are some good recordings of Macbeth out there. There was oh, a <laughs> filmed version of the Patrick Stewart production, which I really like. There's the Roman Polanski movie, which is hilariously <laughs> bad. Featured in many an English literature class. Oh, man. It's the one everyone watches in high school if they watch it. There is the Cohen brother one singular Coen Brother movie, The Tragedy of Macbeth with Denzel Washington. There's also the one that had uh, Marion Cotillard in it a few years ago. So you've got some options here. Uh, so Sleep No More is a is a show that I think actually has ex- escaped sort of beyond the realms of immersive theater. It has like permeated pop culture in a way that I find very fascinating. It, it's more than just escape the realms. It created immersive theater as an mm-hmm. industry. It didn't create it aesthetically. There is always there have always been kind of more interactive or more creatively staged theater since the beginning of the whole time that we've been doing this whole thing, right? Uh, Religious Mm. ceremonial dances and promenades and parades and things like that. This has always been kind of a part of theater. And over time, we slowly built up a system where starting basically in Italy in the late 1500s and then spreading to the European continent where we started putting things in kind of a picture frame. Right. Theater, as we understand it, is not that much different from a movie. You kind of expect the same things. Plenty of old theaters did both stage and movies where you're looking into a window. You're looking through what's called the proscenium arch. But, you know, Shakespeare's theater was not like that. Right. When William Shakespeare was writing, his theater was modeled essentially off of like the courtyards of inns Mm -hmm. where you were Mm. just on a little porch And when those characters are doing asides to the audience, it's not like talking through the window at the crowd of people. It's like you're literally just talking to the guy that's standing right in front of you watching the play. And it creates a a certain intimacy that that we then lose in favor of a lot more creative control. Right. Because when you have Hmm. your stage through a picture frame, you can create big, elaborate sets. You can move things around. You can control light better. And so it became sort of the standard industry model, especially once theater was a very big commercial industry in the 19th century. I I just think it's very interesting about specifically Shakespeare writing for that sort of environment, because you can always tell in the comedic monologues, particularly in Macbeth, where the porter who the poor porter who has to be the sole comic relief of the entire play (laughs) has this monologue that he gives to the audience. And there's stuff written in there that seems to like be audience proof. In that Mm -hmm. if somebody were to heckle the porter, there are lines in there that seem to be responding to people heckling him. Mm, So it's this very cool thing where if you read a lot of the comedic monologues in Shakespeare with the mindset that there's an audience like actively booing him, (laughs) it really adds to like the texture of it. And it's like, you know, Shakespeare loved his high poetry and that really comes through. But he was also very, very good about anticipating audiences reactions to his plays. Dara, I'm curious, do you have like a background or experience with like Shakespeare or quote unquote conventional theater? Like, is that at all your jam or not really? I really don't have a big background in in like conventional theater in that way. I definitely come from the side of performance and the stage, but truly in like a concert dance perspective, I have never Shakespeare'd as it were. <laughs> um, although I did audition once, not very well for a Shakespeare production. Um, but no, I don't have a lot of conventional acting or or a theater background. Macbeth, for its part, doesn't really get performed too, too often because it it's is a cursed. very difficult play to stage effectively, <laughs> uh, to quote, to quote <laughs> Sings and Arrow season two. But it is well, one director. I think it was the director of the Patrick Stewart production said the only curse is the fucking structure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a tough yeah. play because all yeah. a lot of good shit happens for the first half. And then, uh, and like then finally, finally there's a bunch of killing it's, again. It's kind of like Julius Caesar in that yeah. regard, which yeah. we've also talked about on the show, where there were a few plays where Shakespeare just wrote a bunch of banger setups yeah. and then didn't quite know how to pay all of them off. And and Macbeth is definitely one of those plays. Yeah, once you get mm-hmm. to like act, Acts 3 and 4, it's like, okay, what are we doing here? And then Act 5 comes around. But Macbeth is also a... a 
an incredibly violent play. There's a lot of fighting, a lot of killing, a lot of stabbing, and a lot of ways that that could go wrong. And it does. And and people have died in productions of Macbeth yeah. since time immemorial. There's, of course, the belief that uh, it has actual witches incantations woven into the script. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, But in the 19th century, it was really, really dominated by the proscenium arch. And you didn't see a whole lot of... Alternate forms, of course, this is talking specifically from like a European and American perspective. Someone who came to mind when I was kind of looking through the notes and thinking about how immersive performance, maybe not necessarily theater came about, was Isadora Duncan. Mm. Because she was one of these kind of pioneer modern dance choreographers and she rejected the proscenium stage um, almost entirely. She okay. would take her dancers out into like botanical gardens to do performances and move through. And like the audience could just sit there with their picnic and mm. watch as it passed by or follow them along, which is kind of interesting. Or she would literally take her dances to rich people's houses. She would show up and do a performance in their study or in their drawing room or things like this. And so she was working on site specific choreography before that was really a thing. I bet the rich people fucking love that, too, to be like, oh, this is my fancy little performance in my fancy little drawing room. Exactly. Oh, she's made it just for me to watch. (laughs) It's not the last time that rich people have paid a lot of money to follow a dancing Duncan. For example, sleep no more. So also at the end of the 19th century, we get the creation of the modern amusement park, the industrial amusement park, where you put people in vehicles that force them into like roller coaster loops that that produce like 15 G's and break their necks and (laughs) shit. But another thing that comes out, you know, we're making roller coasters, we're making coal, steam and then electrical powered um, dark rides and dark rides Mm. start around like the 1870s, 80s. You get in a little buggy. And you go on a little track and the ride itself is not going to be going super fast, but you'll have little mechanical doodads jumping out at you and showing you their penis or something scary, you know? Right. Nothing scarier than a penis. (laughs) (laughs) Depends on the penis. I I think I was talking with you guys about this when we went to Sleep No More about how like people back then were so easily entertained. Yeah. Like you could do literally anything and they'd be like, like we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago, like parades. Everyone just went to parades all the time. That's all you had. Couldn't get enough of it. By the way, uh, just to sort of close that loop on parades, Uh I had told y'all that I would be going to the Rose Parade, which is one of the best parades, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other than the marching bands, it kind of sucked. Yes. It's a parade. Yeah. It's not that exciting. It's not, the no. par- it's not the kind of parade where they throw candy at you either. No, it's not. So it's bullshit. Mm-mm. If they just Mm-mm. fucking threw candy, it would make it like 10 times better. But no. Mm. Ooh, we have big floats that are yep. made out of a bunch of flowers. How about you flower these nuts, motherfucker? So uh, amusement parks bring us the dark ride. And in New York, people are insane. In general, somewhat infamously, we had a Pan-American exposition in Buffalo, New York. Oh, did something happen there? Something did happen there. In fact, uh, a Mm. man created an experience called a trip to the moon, an electrically powered dark ride where people got into a gigantic airship inspired by the works of Jules Verne and slowly Mm. chugged along while they were like guys who pretended to be airship workers with like ropes and chains and whatever and and leather and uh no uh (laughs) (laughs) what is this and then they took their Penises out? Is yeah, that what's yeah, a lot of penises. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Right. Okay. No, Makes they sense. eventually sounds like my kind of Friday night. Mm-hmm. Eventually, this giant ship would then land on the moon. There would be a bunch of like pieces of scenery that would slide in and out. They'd fly over like a miniature buffalo, and then the the planet Earth, cool. sort of like the beginning of the Peter Pan ride at Disneyland. Oh, cool. And yeah. they'd land on the moon, and there would be a bunch of actors dressed up as moon people to like dance around them and probably taking a little bit from Isadora Duncan here and and being like, you know, welcome to the moon. Or I don't know if they spoke in like moon language or something, but President William McKinley actually went on that ride. 
and then something happened to him a couple days later. <laughs> I saw moon people bang. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> this ride ends up being expanded and moved from Buffalo down to Coney Island, to Coney Ooh. Island's Luna Park. That's why it's called that. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah, because of this big moon ride. So this was a big, a big deal. It had like 200 employees working on it. Most of them yeah. as actors. Some of them paid. We also get uh, a theory of theater that is developed in the early 20th century by uh, an actor named Antonin Artaud. And Artaud was, uh, he was a theater actor, but he was also a movie actor. You can see him in The Passion of Joan of Arc, for instance. He came up with this idea of theater of cruelty. And if you ever read The Theater and Its Double, his book about it, it's like, what exactly is he proposing? And he doesn't entirely know. He right. just wants a theater that is like this sort of all encompassing. At one point, he like theorizes maybe we could tell Lear better if we could somehow make the room into his white beard. That doesn't sound like a good production at all. I disagree <laughs> with that idea. Well, I mean, his whole thing is just like, you know, he write, he writes Spurt of Blood, which is sort of like the the play that you read of his mm. when you go to theater school. And he's just like at one point, the stage directions are like uh, a ziggurat falls from the sky. Mm. Yeah. And it's like Ball. it is a favorite of people the stage because you can the thing about theater is you can do all that mm -hmm. like these stage directions that seem impossible you it's just representation so you can you can do a little cardboard cut out of a ziggurat and have it fall from the sky well, and, and it accomplishes and, and, what the stage and then you can says. also go ahead and you know pray to a spider god and the, the spider god yeah, can perhaps build a ziggurat in the middle <laughs> lots of the desert, things you can do know. lots of things you can it do it wasn't a genre you know we had like symbolist theater and absurdist theater and you know whatever else but we didn't have like a theater of cruelty movement that arose from this except right. later Ooh. some of this is a response of course to the fact that now we have movies and tv you can watch accurate depictions of life in a way that comes immediately to you sort of like in how in the same way photography led to more abstract artistic expression because they're like well a photograph can recreate the realistic image what else can we do that it can't one thing that it can't do reliably make you laugh every time you look at that photograph. Every time I do, it makes me laugh, at mm. least. <laughs> <laughs> I want my nickel back. That's what I said after I went on a trip to the moon in 1903. Hey, hey. Wow. Wow. Brian, the one unimpressed person at the Great Pan-American Excuse me, sir. Field. I would like back my hay nickel. Those were not moon people. Those were just actors with their penises out. <laughs> you know that I am scared of penises. And then the barker pulls out his big stick and taps the no refunds yeah, yeah. Right. sign. We didn't say yeah. they are moon people. We said they do moon people. <laughs> With their butts. <laughs> yeah, of course. Speaking of penises, in 1955, mm. Walter Elias Disney, a friend yeah. of yours, Mickey. Oh, a uh, huge penis, that guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was a penis. Um, he opened Disneyland and he created rides that were not just like you get on a track and it moves and it goes somewhere, but they have a whole experience. Right. You know, he expanded right. the dark ride from just horror, although he kept that with the Snow White ride. But he also made rides that could tell you the story of, you know, Alice in Wonderland or Pinocchio or, or a bunch of else. pirates, perhaps. Pirates, or yes. Hanging out in a secret cove in the Caribbean or Frog and Toad, where you literally go to hell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not Frog for and Toad. Children. <laughs> Not Frog and Toad. It's Wind in the it's, Willows. It's, not, it's the Wind in the, the Willows. It's not the, it's not the heartwarming say, tales about two gay two young gay men. For, yeah, yeah. See, yeah. And that, that's what I was going to say. I was like, I, I, my brain could never make the connection. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, AJ, it's just as weird that Mr. Toad from The Wind in the Willows, one of the like gentlest little children's books about fun talking animals, it is insane that he goes to hell. Well, I don't ride. know. <laughs> I was in a high school production of Wind in the Willows where I played Mr. Toad, and really? I almost drove my car into the orchestra. Pit. They had a working car. They, 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 <laughs> well, they took a golf cart and put panels on it. And <laughs> oh, um, like, no. I almost died and killed a couple people when oh, I okay. so, nearly drove <laughs> Mr. Toad's car into the orchestra pit at my high school. So when you did that, did you make this sound? <laughs> That is exactly the sound that I made. <laughs> no, actually, I didn't know that I had done it until later on. Classic you. No, I was so oblivious. Everybody was 
<laughs> fucking terrified. So I, I just want to bring up Disneyland because it is a game changer in terms of attraction design and in terms of like sure. theming the shit out of stuff, right? To this day, yeah. theme parks need to compete with Disneyland by also licensing characters from media properties, right? Right. After after Disneyland comes into place, we also have a rising counterculture in 1950s and 60s that, of course, Walter Disney is not a part of at all. Although sometimes they really like some of the things he puts out, like Fantasia. Oh, sure. John Cage is one of the most famous artists of of these these happenings and happenings would be like you're not expecting a thing to happen and it might be in any kind of public place some people might be invited or whatever and the the mm. the, the the definition gets more and more diluted over time like a flash mob perhaps exactly Ooh. like flash mobs so john cage's most famous happening is a piece of music he wrote called 4 minutes and 33 seconds where he goes out onto the stage, sits at a piano. You can do other arrangements. You can have a full orchestra and pulls up the little piano door thing and plays absolutely nothing for exactly four minutes and 33 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. the idea of that is that the music is the response to that lack of sound. It's the sound in the space. Everyone's going to get uncomfortable. They're going to start giggling. They're going to get mad. Who knows? I do think it's very funny that every time John Cage is interviewed about that song, he's like, Nobody understands it. And I'm like, John, I think we get it. It's we about get it, dude. the sound in the space. Like, no, but it's not just about that. It's about the sound in the space. I'm like, that's what, that's we, what just, we said. John, that's what we just said. It's about the sound. He's like, yeah, but it's no. about the sound in the space. And, mm. and it's just that for like pages and pages and pages. Like a fucking I, Meisner exercise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Alvin Lucier takes that conversation and plays it through a tape over and over and over again until you get it to resonant yeah, tones. Yeah, You're wearing yeah. a track that suit. is an experiment. <laughs> Mental <laughs> composition joke. I hey, got it. I got yeah. it. It's You're like it's like these classic knock knock jokes. You know, knock knock. Who's there? Who's there? It's Philip Glass. Knock knock. Who's there? Who's it's there? It's Philip Glass. Knock knock. Yeah. Two three yeah. four. And then Two, there's three, the, the Steve. Two, three four. There, there's the Steve Reich knock knock joke, which just goes knock 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 yeah. knock knock. Yeah, anyway. um, so, <laughs> so in the '60s we get something called the performing group, which is again one of the most '60s ass sounding things I've ever heard in my fucking life. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. It's like I'm gonna name my band the band or people or yep. fucking whatever. <laughs> hey, hey, take a load off, Brian. Yeah. Take a load for free. <laughs> and so, like the names of like the most avant garde artists in the '60s are indistinguishable from like consulting firms in the 2020s that have like. <laughs> genocide on their hands Um, oh my god the performing group eventually kind of splinters off and the last remnant of it that's still around is something called the Wooster group which still operates in New York and the performing group was uh, famous for doing happenings and they did a site specific using that term again show called Dionysus in 69 based on (laughs) the Bacchae uh, nice. With definitely nice. the uh, all the connotations that that has, and this was done in like a parking garage. Um, it was mm, filmed. Yep. You can actually watch this movie on split screen. We'll have it in the notes. The filming was done by a very young man named Brian De Palma. What the performing group does is is really synthesizing a lot of theater of cruelty. It's a lot of yeah. moaning, uh, jock straps, um, touching. Mm. You know, audiences are seated on the floor on scaffolds no one's really in chairs they'll be grabbed and moved around and the audience got really into this and this run kept extending longer and longer and longer and there was a point where the they got so rowdy someone took Bacchus I think and just removed him like left the place with like picked him up and carried him out and he was probably nude at the time this was a guy um, they oh. took a whole guy and they just a whole him guy and, what? and so what the rest of the group does <laughs> is they find someone in the audience who knows the text cuz they've come and seen it so many times and they end up performing as Bacchus for the rest of the show. Whoa. Oh. Now that's an offstage swing. Like, yeah. come on. Wow. Like Broadway yeah. is back. That's right. <laughs> that's like the fucking thing in football of like, and they needed another man. And somebody yeah. stood up and said, it's I will like, be I'll the, do it. I'll be the man. In some fucking, <laughs> I'll be new. That's yeah. right. And it's like, Me, yeah, that's, my dick. that's kind of cool artistically <laughs> that they were able to do that. But also like, where's that guy? What happened to him? Right? Did, did they bring like, him back? Did they, did, yes. did they hurt him? Him? Mm. Like, mm. where did he go? Is he okay? 
this becomes mm. kind of a pattern that we're going to see when we talk about Sleep No More in particular. So I'm sure you must know like the Cunningham Cage. I do not. Collaboration, Merce Cunningham and John Cage. Uh, from the Rent lyric. Oh, yeah, right. Cunningham and, and Cage. Cage. Like we're famous collaborators. Cage would write some music. Cunningham would choreograph something. They would not put them together until they performed the pieces. Oh, wow. It was all very based oh, on chance. Okay. They would like he was very into that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. He would set up all these different like movement phrases that the dancers would know. And then backstage, they would roll dice to decide like what order they would go in. So many possible- hey there, you are listening to a preview of a premium episode of the worst of all possible worlds. If you'd like to listen to the rest of this, head on over to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash worst of all. And you can listen to not only the rest of this episode, but our entire backlog of premium episodes, bonus episodes, and if you subscribe at the $10 tier, you will get an extra episode of the podcast every single month. Again, that is patreon.com slash worst of all. Hope to see you there.